please welcome author and professor Stephen Collis. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. I am a, I'm an attorney who represents religious institutions across the country, an author and a law professor. I'm not here today as one of the attorneys in Jack's case, but as a scholar and author who is an advocate for religious freedom. I'm an advocate for religious freedom, not because I believe it is a tool that can be used to harm others, but because it is a fundamental liberty that protects each and every individual living in this country. It has allowed us, those who live in the most religiously diverse country in human history, to exist in relative peace with one another. This peace is unique in history, and it is even exceptional in the world today. As one scholar explained it, in history that was recent to the American founders, governmental attempts to suppress disapproved religious views had caused vast human suffering in Europe and in England, and similar suffering on a smaller scale in the colonies that became the United States." End quote. For centuries prior to the founding of this country, various religious sects tried to control government and then tried to manufacture peace by suppressing any religious views or practices that contradicted those of the people in power. The result was nothing but conflict, and virtually no one was left unscathed. It is important to note that it was not religion that led to this suffering. It was a lack of religious liberty. This is true because if you think about it, every human on this earth has some religious belief. People on both the right and the left sometimes bristle at that notion. But when we think of certain religious questions, such as, is there a God? Why are we on this earth? Where will we go when we die? We realize that all of us have answers to those questions, and those answers are religious answers. The answer may be an agnostic, I don't know, but it is still a religious answer. And those religious answers deserve protection. It isn't those answers that lead to war and conflict. It is a refusal by one faction or another to protect those answers. By the time of the founding, it had become clear to Madison and others that this new country they were trying to form needed to find a way to end the bloodshed. Madison saw the solution in a way that no one else had to that point. He wrote, Torrents of blood have been spilt in the old world by vain attempts of the secular arm to extinguish religious discord and to prevent all differences in religious opinions. Time has at length revealed the true remedy. Every relaxation of narrow and rigorous policy, wherever it has been tried, has been found to assuage the disease. That is to say, every time government has allowed religious people to have the religious exemptions they need if they are conscientious objectors, it has assuaged the disease of war and bloodshed. Madison goes on, the American theater has exhibited proofs that equal and complete liberty, if it does not wholly eradicate the, the conflict, sufficiently destroys its malignant influence on the health and prosperity of the state. In other words, to rephrase what Madison was saying, wherever possible, when government recognizes exemptions for religious objectors to laws that otherwise apply to everyone else, the conflict between people of different and sometimes even very opposite beliefs tends to dissipate. In our country, Madison's foresight has proven true time and time again. And what is remarkable is the breadth with which religious liberty, when properly applied, has protected our citizenry. Let me give just a few examples. I could go on for an entire year at a law school like I do. Let me just give a few examples. They involve people of very different religious beliefs. What binds them together is one unbreakable thread that stretches and twines across the United States. The principle that religious liberty is a liberty for all of us. One that, our country, one that is our country's great gift to the world. One that protects us regardless of our beliefs and one that we must not take for granted. I think you'll notice a familiar pattern in each of these cases. They each involve a law or regulation that didn't burden the majority of people. They each involve a religious dissenter who asked to be exempted from the law because of his or her religious beliefs. And they each involve a respect and recognition for religious liberty that is too often completely lacking in much of our society today. The first involves the Quakers. Very early in the history of the United States, the Quakers both refused to take oaths and to serve in the military. The general rule was that every able-bodied man needed to join the military. The founders could have forced them to do so. They could have demanded do as we say, or you face fine, a prison, or both. Instead, they offered exemptions. 
George Washington wrote to the Quakers, I assure you very explicitly, he said, that in my opinion, the conscientious scruples of all men should be treated with great delicacy and tenderness. And it is my wish and desire that the laws may always be as extensively accommodated to them as the essential interest of the nations may justify and permit." End quote. As a result, the Quakers were able to contribute to the founding of this nation without conflict. Just a short time later, in 1813, for another example, a Catholic priest named Anthony Coleman was doing his duty in what was then a still rural Manhattan. Someone approached him and confessed that they had been involved in a jewelry theft. As part of the penance process, the confessor gave the jewelry to the priest, Mr. Coleman, who then returned it to its rightful owner. The police wanted to know who the confessor was and demanded that Coleman testify, and they took him to court and demanded that he testify who had given him the jewelry. The general rule was that those with knowledge important to the legal process were required to testify. Coleman asked for an exemption on the basis that to Catholics, the secrecy of the confessional was an absolute religious requirement. He could not reveal who had confessed to him without violating his sacred religious beliefs. The majority view was that the Catholic doctrine was wrong and posed a great threat to society. That was what the prosecutor argued. The judge in the case saw things differently. He was a Protestant. He didn't agree with the Catholic priest's religious views. Still, he ruled, and this is his quote, it cannot for a moment be believed that the mild and just principles of the law would place the witness in such a dreadful predicament, in such a horrible dilemma. If he tells the truth, he violates his ecclesiastical oath. If he prevaricates, he violates his judicial oath. The only course is for the court to declare that he shall not testify at all. The judge continued, although no human legislature has a right to meddle with religion, Yet the history of the world is a history of oppression and tyranny over the consciousness of men. The sages who formed our Constitution sought to prevent the introduction of calamities that have deluged the world with tears and blood." End quote. That priest, Anthony Coleman, walked free from that New York courtroom. Over a century and a half later, in the summer of 1959, long after the development of Manhattan and the bloody battles of the Civil War, a middle-aged office manager at a Bethesda, Maryland construction company, slogged up the steps of another courthouse. His name was Roy Torcaso. He sought an appointment as a notary public. Shouldn't have been too difficult to pull off. There was only one problem. The general rule in Maryland at the time was that to be a notary public, you had to sign an oath declaring that you believed in God. Roy was many things. He was a veteran of two wars, World War II and the Korean War. He was a family man, he was a dedicated father, a devoted husband, a son, a handyman, a lover of chess, and a thoughtful philosopher. He was also an atheist. The clerk gave him an impossible choice, profess a belief he did not hold and get the job, or hold to his beliefs and face exclusion from the profession of his choice. Roy challenged the law. Needless to say, his beliefs were not popular. He was seeking an exemption from the general rule. He lost in the trial court. He lost unanimously in the Maryland Court of Appeals. When his case reached the Supreme Court, he won nine to nothing. The court stated, quote, we repeat and again reaffirm that neither a state nor the federal government can constitutionally force a person to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. No person can be punished for entertaining or professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs for church attendance or non-attendance, end quote. Those are just a few examples, but the list goes on and on. Throughout our country's history, religious liberty has protected Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Sikhs, agnostics, atheists, the Amish, Seventh-day Adventists, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and dozens of other creeds. And in every instance, the cases involved people like Jack, who were willing to put their reputations and livelihoods at risk for their religious convictions hoping along the way that someone, a judge or government official, would understand the importance of their cause. I don't know how the justices will rule in this particular case, but I do hope that they will treat this very important liberty with reverence. I urge them to cherish it as the founders did. If it is treated flippantly, if it is wrongly discarded as nothing more than a justification for bigotry, every single one of us will lose. And I do mean every single one of us, including those people who think they oppose Mr. Phillips. Thank you.